money. Baseball fever. You caught it and caught it big. But you're not looking for a cure. You're looking for a job. Join the crowd. This is a profession where you can dream and make it a profession. To me, it's not work. You know, to me, what I do is fun. My God, this is a soap opera magnified to the umph degree. Let's get the show on the road. And now, Jim Palmer and James Brown. <laughs> this one right to me. That face looks so amazing. Yeah. Nice Hello and here. welcome everyone to So You Want to Be in Baseball. I'm James Brown. And I'm Jim Palmer. Now every year attendance figures prove that the epidemic of baseball fever infects more than just the players on the field. As a matter of fact, millions of fans flock to ballparks all over the country. And many of those fans would like to get a job close to the game, even though they may not have the skills to hit, run, and throw like the pros. Now today we're going to visit some pros of our own. No, they're not players, but they are close to the action and they all love their jobs. As a matter of fact, they'll help you get to first base on your path to a career in the national pastime. And leading off our batting order is a veteran who's been around the game for almost 30 years. Yeah, hard to believe. <laughs> now, for most of us, the very first time we ever see a baseball player is not at the ballpark, but in the sports pages. And there are some very talented people making their living taking those pictures. And one of them is Walter Yaus Jr. Now, he captures the splendid action and the telling mood of the game from magazines like Sports Illustrated. And now here is a look at the world of the sports photographer. Jackson almost hit it out of state. It was something that I did to get around the fact that there were problems in my family. I mean, it was something that I did all the time. My parents were divorced, and this was during a period of time parents weren't divorced. Life seemed to look better through a 300 millimeter lens. I mean, you just isolate everything. Part of the team now. <laughs> when I was a junior in high school, I had called up Sports Illustrated one day. And at that time, I had braces on my teeth, and I was always going to the orthodontist. So I was orthodontist. They said, OK, bye. So I went to New York. I took the train into New York and showed them this little portfolio I had. They'd go to the Giants game or I'd go to the Baltimore game and they paid you $150 and my friends were amazed. I was amazed. And it was something I really liked and something I could do. <laughs> Photography is a hard area to break into today because there are a lot of photographers. A lot more than when I started. Go on. Whoa, okay, we got... I've handed him cameras with no film, and then, uh, you know, he shot a roll of film I thought he was shooting, and uh, I'd say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, there's no film. Most photographers, you're fired, you're gone, but he's just like, oh, all right, put film in the camera. Anyone that's in, interested in photography should take some sort of course and try to learn the fundamentals of lighting, composition, technique, equipment. I mean, there's so much more now than there was 30 years ago. Hey, Bobby. Are these your own special you boxes? Welcome to New York, all you guys. Usually the first question asked we ask, how long is this going to take? You know, I've got 10 minutes. I've got to go to dinner. Uh, my wife's waiting. I've got a pool match. You know, it's, it's one or the other. Where are you going, Eddie? You got an appointment tonight? Huh? You have an appointment? I mean, I thought you did need a little sun with this. Well, we don't have any. We've got this. Portable sun. But well, then why we have to wait till 5 o'clock? Because we'd hope for sun. <laughs> You've been through this before. It's your picture. You've got to control that moment when you're there. Even if it's five minutes or two minutes, that's it. It's your only chance. There's no second chance on this cover. I have the same thing. Today. That's it. That's why I noticed it. And you've got to make good, and this is where the pressure of being a photographer is. <laughs> no, this is for the real man. Maybe your uh, brother plays Little League Baseball. You want to pose him in his uniform. You want to take him out late day. Let's go out to the uh, park. I'm going to do you at sunset. I mean, this is the way to start. What I'm doing is, you know, once you arrive there, I'm very happy with what I do. I mean, I've done this since I was 15. I was a dreamer. And this is a profession where you can dream and make it a profession.
A great professional with a terrific job. Now, while water has been shooting sports photos for almost 25 years, young Wendy Fitzgerald is in her rookie season of sports photography. But she paid her dues. Don't get that wrong. She has paid her dues, and she's been a news photo journalist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Ever says it's going to be tough out there. I graduated with 10 people in my class, and maybe two of us are actually working. It's so competitive. But then when you get in, it's like the people that I beat out for the job said, Well, you got it because you were a woman. That's how they wrote me off. We have people who are established shooters and they aren't speaking to me because they think they should be here and not me. And I feel extra pressure to do a better job than they did. And if I screw up, it, I just agonize over it. I'm, I'm scared. I'm really intimidated and I'm scared. And you say, be in the locker room? I haven't even gone in the locker room. I saw, I saw butt cheeks the other day and I was like, whoa! I'm the one who gets like the crotch grabbing and the oh, weird position you're in, you know. I hide behind the lens even more, like, why are you singling me out to hassle me? There you, go. you just have to get tougher and just not let things bug you. And just, even if it does bug you, don't let it show. When I was younger, all I wanted to do was be a photographer. And now I'm 33 and I feel like I'm actually there. <laughs> Yes, yeah, she certainly is actually there. If you want to work with Wendy and Walter in the competitive world of the sports photographer, a good way to start is with an internship at a local newspaper. Let me be honest with me. Were you an easy person to work with when you were being photoed as a player? Oh, as a player? Probably more difficult than when I was in my underwear, to be quite <laughs> honest. <laughs> being truthful about it. All right, we'll move quickly along here then. Besides photography, one of baseball's most successful marketing tools is television. And there are plenty of people working behind the scenes to get those ball games into your home. Now, it takes a great deal of skill, knowledge, and strength to handle the cameras that bring you those wonderful pictures. One of the best TV camera operators is an Emmy Award winner who spent time in studios shooting the likes of The Cosby Show. She's Donna Quanta, and she's here with us now on the other end of the camera. Let's welcome Donna Quanta here with us, folks. Give her a hand. Welcome, Donna. Nice having you with us. Thank you. Donna, we just heard Wendy's uh, point of view, but be honest, was it difficult for you to break into the business and be accepted by your colleagues in pretty much a male-dominated environment? Yes, um, particularly in sports. Um, television mostly is men in any part of it and getting into the sports part was even more difficult because that's definitely all men uh, you know you look around here today in the studio you see two women and that's the way it is in almost every studio you go into any sporting event uh, at Orioles baseball I'm practically the only woman now it, do you look at it as, as just a glamorous job do you look at it as a job I mean do you really enjoy what you're doing I love what I'm doing it's not glamorous as far as I'm concerned there are moments of glamour, few and far between. Mostly, it's work, and mm -hmm. it's hard work. Now, we have an audience comprised of uh, youngsters, uh, ladies and gentlemen from the, the, the metropolitan area here in Washington and the Virginia area. Do we have some questions? Oh, now, truly, we have somebody who's a little bold that may want to ask a question of uh, Donna breaking into the business. Mm -hmm. All right, young lady over here. Um, my name is Joyce Walker, and I'm from Flint House School. And I was wondering if the locker rooms are really out of control like the media says they are. Ooh, that's a good one. Are the locker rooms out of control like the media says, huh? Um, I don't really go in the locker room. You're a smart lady. <laughs> what, do you, what do you hear? Uh, I hear, yes, they are. <laughs> I see mostly the players in the dugout. When we were in Memorial Stadium, I used to have to go past the locker room, but I always kind of went like this and tried not to look. Um, so I really don't know. Do we have any other questions? I do hear stories. Yes. Um, yes, my name is Sue Adeboyiku from um, Bethesda Cherry Chase High School. And um, except for Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, basketball, and lots of cheerleading, the, um, why don't we see um, more women's sports on television? 
I don't know. You'd have to ask a producer because that's that's a good question. I think probably because there wouldn't be enough viewership for it, or the powers that be feel that there wouldn't be enough viewership, and it all boils down to money. Okay, we have about forty, maybe thirty seconds, forty-five seconds. Your advice to uh, to a young lady that would want to get into into your business? First of all, get an education. Uh, it'll help no matter where you go. Take a job in television, doing anything you can get because nobody starts at the job that they end up with. And um, just work your way from there. And I trust maintaining an aggressive nature is still important to you even now? <sighs> to a point, yes. <laughs> right. um, you can't go too overboard with it. I understand, and I think we hear exactly what you're saying. <laughs> Thank you very much, Donna, for joining us here. As a matter of fact, Donna, Wendy, and Walter all took different paths to the same destination in a career in baseball. Coming up, we'll meet a player who many consider to be the best in the business, Cal Ripken, Jr. The numbers are definitely against you, making it as a big league ball player. There's only so many positions, uh, and I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. But uh, uh, a good uh, uh, way to think nowadays is the college baseball programs have gotten so much better that uh, a lot of people are choosing to go to college because they can develop their baseball skills, but also get an education uh, just in case they don't have the opportunity to make it to the big leagues. There's a lot of obstacles in making it to big leagues. One's injury, one is just that you don't have enough talent. And sometimes you might have enough talent and you're not injured, but then the opportunity is, isn't there. So the numbers are against you. I think more and more people are deciding to go to college now um, because they recognize they have this dream that they want to be a ball player and they want to make it to the big leagues. But at the same time, I think they're starting to understand how difficult it is to get there. The way that I looked at it was, uh, I know the numbers are against me. Uh, whether I'm going to make it to the big leagues or not, I might have the talent. I just don't know. But uh, I'm going to give it my best shot in baseball. And if I don't make it in baseball, then I'm, I'm going to go back to school and I'll probably be a 25 or 26-year-old freshman. Baseball, I think, was designed uh, with frustration in mind. Uh, your success rate as a hitter is only 30% if you're a good hitter. You fail 7 out of 10 times. The, there's so much frustration in the game that it's hard to determine which one is more. But at this point in my career, there is a lot of frustration with, with people wanting your time and pulling you in different directions. You want to just stay focused and, and, and do what what you do best, and that's play baseball. But but if you're successful in baseball, then uh, then more people want you to do other things, and you start to uh, to get into other things, and, and you're pulled in a lot of different directions. And you really should, at least me, I, I just want to be able to stay focused and do what I can do, and that's play baseball. Growing up as a kid, I think it made me work a lot harder uh, in baseball because uh, everyone knew that my dad was in professional baseball and they expected me to be pretty good and so there was, a, there was some pressure to begin with to succeed and maybe overachieve so it made me work harder and, and want to be the best I could be. He's called the Iron Man because he played more than 1,600 consecutive games. Now in 1991 he was voted the most valuable player in the All-Star Game and for the second time most valuable player in the American League. He also won a gold glove at a very difficult position of shortstop while hitting over 360, almost 400 on the road. But as we'll see, some of Cal Ripken's most impressive stats aren't being compiled on the diamond. They're in the community, where he's posting some big numbers in his campaign for adult literacy. Three sixteen, four sixteen, five sixteen. I'm proud to be at the Kyle Ripken Center. At 31, Cal Ripken Jr. has arrived. Spoken of in the same breath as Garrig, Aaron, and Rose, some call him baseball's best. All right, Cal, gonna get started now. Baseball is kind of a funny game where it's, it's a lot of individual performances. And when you're hitting, nobody can help you. When you're fielding the ball, really no one can help you. And if you do your part, and that guy does his part, and the other guy does his part, if you do it all collectively together, you can be successful. You got to do it day in and day out, day in and day out, and there's a tremendous pressure on you to to perform uh, and uh, perform on a daily basis. It's impossible to do it, and as I said before, the success rate if you're a good hitter is only 30 percent. So you have to deal with the failure 70 percent of the time. That's a tough thing to do. Being a legend in the making isn't something that Cal takes lightly. I remembered how I felt towards the ballplayers. I emulated and copied you know, everything that they did. So now that I'm in a position 
uh, of influence. I try to be very careful about what I do, what I say, because whether you like it or not, in my opinion, I think that you're, you are a, ro a role model. Um, it's just whether you accept the responsibility or not. Kill Ripken does it again. A three-run over wins the game for the Orioles. Hey, guys, what about that home run I hit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, what's with you guys? Didn't you... <laughs> Cal doesn't just talk a good game. In 1990, when he wanted to give something back to the city that has given him so much, he donated a quarter of a million dollars to establish the Ripken Learning Center in downtown Baltimore. Baltimore, the city that reads. Cares for his people, no matter what race, color, or whatever, he just cares. So he wants to see everybody get ahead. And I thank him. In the Baltimore metropolitan area, they're saying that 50% uh, of all people over the age of 18 uh, do not have a high school diploma. Uh, they're functionally illiterate, which means that they can't fill an application form out properly when they're looking for a job. Uh, they have difficulty in reading medicine bottles to give dispensed uh, doses to the children. So these are the type of problems that we're having in our society, and these are the type of problems that these students are coming here and being very heroic and trying to attack. W-H-O-L-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-
I guess I'm like a mother with part of the players, you know? Well, I am the only owner that can hug their players without people talking, okay? Cause a sensation otherwise. I'm not ashamed of the job I've done. Um, you know, when I took this thing over, it was financially a disaster, and uh, I see nothing wrong if somebody is capable, whether they're a woman or whatever they are, they can do the job, they can do the job. Well, although Earl Weaver wasn't an owner, what would you have done if he had come and hugged you, uh, big fella? As long as he didn't try to kiss me. <laughs> as, as we can see, Mark Schott has a very strong opinion about the money players are making. And there's always another side to the story, the player's side. And with us is a man who makes a very successful living representing players and taking on owners like Marge. His name is Agent Ron Shapiro. That's what we call him in Baltimore. And his list of clients read like an all-star game roster. Cal Ripken, Kirby Puckett, Eddie Murray, and yours truly among them. And let's uh, welcome Ron Shapiro. Thank you. Good to see you for being with us. Good to be here. Now you went, you know, you went to you went to Harvard. Uh, you have a law practice. You practiced law 16 years ago. What what made you become a player's agent? Well, I, I love sports and I love people and I like giving advice. And sports, people, and advice are what being an agent is really all about. I also had an, a lucky opportunity. Uh, I had been the securities commissioner of Maryland. My job was to prevent fraud and in investment. Uh, I created a reputation. One day the Orioles called me after I left that office and they said, help Brooks Robinson get out of financial trouble. It was the beginning of my career in baseball. And I saw him the other day and he's smiling, so you must have done the job. <laughs> uh, $7 million, Sandberg. I mean, you're an agent. You have some of the best players in baseball. Kirby Puckett's going to be a free agent, as is Cal Ripken. I don't know if you have any other potential free agents. Uh, is $7 million, are we, are we going to see a player making more money than that? And, and, and the second part of that question, can the fans relate to it? Well, it's difficult for the fans to relate to. The only way anyone, and it's difficult for anyone to relate to it when teachers are being paid what they're paid, social workers are being paid what they're paid. The only way you can relate to it is to understand that baseball is a piece of the entertainment business. And then when you think about Michael Jackson getting $65 million a year, Oprah getting $80 million a year, uh, Bill Cosby $100 million, I could go on and on and on, rock singers, then all of a sudden you see it in the context of what's happened in the entertainment industry today. The key is if you get players like Ripken and Puckett, who not only receive, but put back in the community. That's our theme. That's another way that you can get people to begin to understand that they're real human beings. Now, I know that Jimmy and I could ask you an awful lot of questions, but let's get this audience involved. Who's got the first question for Ron Shapiro? Um, I'm John Bushman, and I attend McLean High School. And how do you feel about players or uh, college athletes who leave school a year early to play in the pros? John, I would feel very badly about it if those college athletes were getting a real education. Unfortunately today, college sports, big time college sports, is really an adjunct of pro sports and therefore I don't feel quite as badly. I wish we could get the education in and some of the sports out. Okay, one quick question. Um, Anybody else? Yeah, I'm Mario Diaz from Bethesda Chevy Chase High School and I was wondering, after a player's career is over, what advice would you offer him on how to handle the change? Well, it's the most difficult thing that faces a player, and you have to be advising him during his career to be thinking about what he's going to be doing after his career to get his heads out of the clouds, forget that you're a celebrity, and to begin to focus on what's going to make you happy day to day. But work at it while you're still playing. Okay, I have one other question. What's the one thing as an agent that you can give to your, to your players? The one most important thing, other I think, than the financial? I think more than contracts, more than anything, or, or try to communicate a set of values about caring about themselves and caring about their communities. All okay. right. As a matter of fact, I know very well because I worked for Ron for a couple of months, and being a family with his players is something that he really believes in. Well, thank you, James. Hey, thank you Thanks, for being Jim. with us. Thank right. you very Cheering. much. Right. Okay, thank take you. care. Right. Right. The best thing to do is to believe in your heart that you can become what you want to become. Uh, whether it's a professional baseball player or a doctor, lawyer, or a uh, janitor, whatever you want to do in life, you can do it if you believe. You set your heart to it. Um, the best thing to do, though, if those goals and dreams don't work out, is to fall back on an education. I was able to get by um, without an education. I'm one of the lucky few, but um, I look forward to going back to, to school when, I'm, when my career is over and finishing up school. I think school is the most important thing a young person can do nowadays. I knew about the sixth grade that I wanted to become a professional athlete. I wasn't sure what sport, but that's kind of the direction I wanted to, to go in life, and so I kept those goals in my mind. And in order to achieve that goal, I knew there were certain things I couldn't get involved with. Couldn't get run around with the wrong crowd, 
Um, I had new school is important. So um, I, I tried to obtain these short-term goals to reach my long-term goals. I knew that uh, running with the wrong crowd was going to deter me from my goal. Uh, I knew a lot of these things along the line um, that weren't good, that weren't in my best interest, were going to drag me away from my goal. And so I tried to stay st uh, focused. You can't do it without school. You have to have an education. Nowadays, they'll t if there's a guy that's just as good as you are in sports, they'll go a step further and they'll look in the classroom and they'll say, who's better there? Then they'll make their, their decision on the academic performance. So the kid really doesn't have a chance. He's got to get in an education, uh, get in a, a college somewhere, and he's got to have a certain grade point average. He's got to have a you know a decent grade point average in order to get in. If he doesn't, uh, uh, they won't take it. You know what? I'll tell you. You got to stay positive. You got to stay focused on what you're doing. If you don't, life will pass you by. Only the strong survive. Build it and he will come is a line from the film Field of Dreams. Well, that saying isn't just Hollywood fiction. It's happening for real right now in Baltimore where the new Oriole Park, a gorgeous stadium at Camden Yards, is drawing fans at a record pace. HOK is an architectural firm that is pioneering baseball's return to the game's golden age. Joe Spear is the chief architect with HOK, and he spent his whole career making fields of dreams come true. Five, four, three, two. This effort has been a five-year process. Uh, it took two years just to build the building. During construction, there'll be conditions that no one could foresee, so you need to be able to think on your feet. A lot of times on a project this size, you'll have several workers standing around waiting for you to make a decision, so sometimes the pressure is pretty intense. People look at it and they see a single building, but we look at it and we see 48,000 seats, 72 luxury boxes, and we see a building that's a half a mile long around the horseshoe. So you see more than just a ballpark when you see it. You see it, you know, those years of your life invested in a project. All these people doing this whole routine instead of just going there, right there. It's very much a profession that is built upon teamwork. Uh, you know, the idea of a, of a single person saying, Eureka, I've got it, uh, really doesn't happen that often. You need to share your ideas with others and be receptive. Third baseman, Al Newman. We all have memories, you know, even when I was young, I remember my dad taking me to uh, baseball games, and baseball particularly has a pretty special place in America, and it's very unique to be involved in a Major League Baseball park. Any young person wanting to be an architect someday needs to have the ability to communicate with drawings. You need to be good in math, and sometimes it takes a business sense because architecture is a business too. So if you're going to do this for a living, you need to have fun doing it. You need to make sure that you enjoy it. I have absolutely no regrets. I'm very happy. <laughs> Jimmy, you're a guy who speaks his mind. Joe Spear obviously did a nice job from a layman's perspective, but how do you compare Oriole Park at Camden Yards to other parks around the Well, it's, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it reminds me when I first came in the league of Fenway Park, a little bit of Tiger Stadium, and a little bit of Yankee Stadium before they remodeled it in the 70s. And, if, of course, if you're an Oriole fan, <laughs> they're winning there. So the fans are coming out, and they're supporting them, and it, and it makes me look like the it, it gives you the feeling the ball ballpark's been there maybe 10 or 15 years, and, and it's brand new. The A's are in town right now. They're having a good time there as well. Oh, huh? yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. While well, we readily welcome the return to the ballparks being built in the old styles of Wrigley Field and Fenway Park, it would be a mistake to let nostalgia blind us when looking at the entire history of baseball. For too long, there were two separate and hardly equal games, one for whites and one for blacks. Some of the game's greatest players like Josh Gibson, Judy Johnson, and hundreds of others never made it to the white major leagues because of outright prejudice. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until 1947 that baseball allowed an incredible athlete and a remarkable man named Jackie Robinson to show the world what it was missing. Jackie Robinson affected baseball because people all over the world knew that he was a good black player and it led to more blacks in the baseball field and led to other great baseball players. 
One of those greats was Hall of Famer Frank Robinson, who, nearly 30 years after Jackie broke the color barrier, became Major League Baseball's first black manager. It was just a band before us. No uh, minorities in involved in the game itself, period. So that was, the door was locked. It was not only closed, it was locked. Now the door is ajar, and uh, you can walk through that door. And, uh, you know, if it isn't ajar, then you knock on it and open it and uh, keep going. And if they won't open it, you keep knocking on the door. Persistence is something Frank knows a lot about. After 35 years in Major League Baseball, many expect him to become the first black general manager in the history of the sport. People are always going to shoot you down, and it's, it just helps that someone's already, you know, been in front of you to say, look, um, I'm good, I'm determined, don't look at my color, look at what I can do. According to Frank, anyone hoping to make the cut in a big league office should start with an internship. Most baseball clubs take on young interns during the season. Get your resume together, send it to the ball club, and address it to the department that you would like to work in, and uh, that would be reviewed. And you could also follow it up with a phone call. I want to concentrate in public relations, so this is really helping me a lot, because right now I'm getting to enjoy what I'm doing. The game time is at 1.35. If you're determined to do what you have to do, then that's what people are going to see, and hopefully you won't run into prejudiced people that just you know, are just going to turn you away regardless of what you can do. When it's not a big deal, when a minority is hired, you know, when baseball doesn't say, hey, we've hired a certain percentage of minorities, when that happens, then you can say, we have arrived. However small the statistical progress, there has been some made, but more importantly, have you noticed an attitude change amongst management at all? I think so. I think people are very aware, and again, again baseball is trying to make that awareness out there and very evident and uh, you know even Frank Robinson would agree that some progress has been made in the last few decades but the pace is too slow now right now Cito Gaston of the Toronto Blue Jays and Hal McRae of the Kansas City Royals are the only minority skippers controversial issues like these are demanding that baseball writers be more than just scorekeepers and just like ball players sports writers have to learn to pay their dues somewhere far below the major league level USA Today writer Rob Brains remembers his early days on the baseball beat Any young kid, whether he wants to be a lawyer or a doctor or a reporter, you know, I, I think you, you think what it's going to be like. And it's, I think there are very few people who have the luxury of, of really enjoying their jobs. To me, it's not work. You know, to me, what I do is fun. I grew up down in Springfield, Missouri, and I hung around the newspaper down there in, in high school. They, Saturday nights, they'd let me, uh, let me sit in the office and uh, type out, uh, you know, box scores and, and just, you know, kind of, Got my you know, feet wet that way a little bit and then uh, you know, moved on up to the college uh, college papers and internships and, and then uh, turned it into a career. Switch hitter, pop the ball. More times than not, the first assignment you'll get as a professional reporter is in a small you know, 10,000 uh, circulation daily newspaper in the middle of Iowa or, or Kansas or Nebraska or someplace. So it's, it's a matter of paying your dues. It's a, it's a matter of uh, you know, working up to, to a, a major league beat. And you're all for that, you know, you're getting like me. Uh, <laughs> the part is you've got to deal with, you know, professional athletes, some of whom are very cooperative and very nice to the media, and some of whom you know, could care less that you're there. People want a piece of your time, and, you only, and there's only so much time in the day, and sometimes you can't give it. It's a matter of give and take, and it's a matter of them understanding you and you understanding them. I said, no way! Yeah, you made a diving catch and right. Oh, man, well, if somebody likes sports and, and likes, uh, you know, putting in that much time and that much work, yeah, I, I think they couldn't pick a better life. Loved it. Loved it. Life away from the home and family is one of the hardest things writers and players have to deal with. The price you pay for having fun, though, right? <laughs> Coming up, we'll meet a doctor who knows Bo's woes. Whoa, what in the world is this? Speaking, Speaking of, of woes. <laughs> Well, at least they're clean underwear. We'll find out who this guy is when we come back in a moment. <laughs> Very few people make it to the big leagues. Uh, the percentage is just minimal. And uh, if you don't have the education uh, after you've given baseball to try, you're in trouble. 
Uh, I think it's important to go to school, uh, go play college ball, and then on to pro ball, and if you don't make it, at least you have the education. There have been some real tough competitors that are well known. For example, uh, Billy Martin was a very tough competitor and died in a tragic accident and, uh, and so on. But, but he had a cliche that has been bandied about and well known. He said, you show, me a, a, you show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. That's 100% wrong. What that's saying is that, it, that, it's, that it's shameful to lose. It's not shameful to lose. What's, what people need to be concerned about is a, afraid of losing, afraid to compete. That's it. Just the courage and the determination to be the best person that you can. Jim Palmer certainly knows this better than me, but being a superstar means fame, status, and wealth. All of it can be very fleeting, gone in a flash. Age or injury can stop a career in its tracks. That's why athletes try so hard to postpone the inevitable by seeking the best medical advice available. It's a lesson Bo Jackson knows all too well. Now, when's that Tour de France thing? Bo Jackson, he could do it all. Air Bo, I like the sound of that. But in the end, Vincent E. Jackson was as mortal as the rest of us. Jackson was running for the L.A. Raiders against Cincinnati when he went in sports, down. Bo Jackson's baseball the career house, may be over. That they have released one Bo Jackson. Don't count me out because I know deep down inside that I'll be back. Bo arrived in Birmingham on crutches for a meeting with a specialist today. This is Bo's today. third trip to Health South to see Dr. Andrews in the last eight weeks or so. He broke a portion of the bone off the back of the hip socket and sort of crushed or jammed the top of the head of the thigh bone. Dr. Andrews is not only a doctor, he's somewhat of a father figure to me and a very close friend. I know I had Dr. Jim just in my corner, so uh, there was no fear or anything. But I do hate needles, so that was probably the only fear that I had. <laughs> Bo's known Dr. Jim for over a decade, but the world has been watching his work at the American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama, for even longer. This is an arthroscope, and this has a fiber optic attached to it and a television camera. That you can suck out debris and, and cut tissue with it and take it out of the shoulder joint. I went to college uh, at LSU on a track and field scholarship and was the SEC pole vault champion and can't pole vault for the rest of your life and the subspecialty in orthopedics which is sports medicine became very uh, interesting to me and that way I could be a doctor and yet continue to be involved in athletics to some degree. Outside of the operating room, players like Cecil Fielder and Jimmy Key have been visiting the Institute's biomechanics lab for years. Today, it's a minor leaguer with the Oakland A's. With the high-tech equipment that they have, they can break it down so well that they can maybe pick up one little thing that the, your eye couldn't pick up. And uh, in pitching, it doesn't take much to, you know, change a ball to a strike. It doesn't jump or feel unstable at all. Just trying to see him go from a triple-A pitcher perhaps to the, and make the major leagues is very rewarding. I've become a fan of these athletes that I take care of. Oh, so you just so you were just going to call my name but until I answered you, all right? Well, I like that. I don't think I can cut it in um, the uh, medical field, dealing with all the problems, the injuries and surgeries and so forth and so on. So I think his job is a little bit harder than mine. But Bo's job won't be an easy one either. He's undergone hip replacement surgery, and even with Dr. Andrews in his corner, that's something no major leaguer has ever come back from. Once you make your mind up what you want to do, you have to set your goals at the top of the shelf and don't stop climbing, but until you reach them. As a physician, I want everybody that I take care of to get well, but in re being realistic, we know that doesn't happen. There's no such word in our vocabulary as can't, in Bo Jackson's vocabulary and my vocabulary, so we still have hope. 
Dr. Andrews' patients aren't just baseball players. He's also helped careers of Jack Nicklaus, Charles Barkley, and Jane Fonda. Now, the great baseball philosopher and Hall of Fame catcher Yogi Berra once said, 90% of the game is half metal. And we're certainly not going to argue with Yogi's wonderful logic. Now, more emphasis is, than ever is being placed on the mental side of the game. And if a quote from Yogi Berra is appropriate, there's no reason to doubt that the wacky world of the Simpsons can shed some light on sports psychology. You better shut your big yap. Oh, you shut up. No, you shut up. No, you shut up. Oh, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Why don't you both shut up? Hi, friends. I'm Dr. Marvin Monroe. Does this scene look familiar? Okay, you want to kill each other. That's good. That's healthy. This is not the way to get healthy! There's many occasions they show anger to try to uh, mask or hide the fact that they're feeling a lot of pain, they're feeling a lot of fear. Being in the world of sports is like being life accelerated. It's life magnified. Age is accelerated. A young man starts a professional baseball career at the age of 18. He's already worried that he's an old man when he's 32 or 33. There are certain individuals who have difficulty dealing with that anxiety. And sometimes the ball clubs uh, bring me in to assist them. Their biggest competitor is not the team on the other side of the field. Their biggest competitor is their fellow teammate who's trying to take their job. It is never talked about. They talk about it to me. Because you see guys with talent that never make it. Yeah. They don't. The difference yeah. between what a sports psychologist would do and what a coach would do. A coach would work on uh, gripping the ball, elbow uh, position, uh, striding, and all those kinds of things. And the sports psychologist might touch on that briefly. But what he's getting to is relaxation. A confidence. Okay, let's take another deep cleansing breath. Steve Sachs had a serious throwing problem uh, a few years back where he couldn't make the simple throw to first base. There's something intertangled in there that they fear they're going to be made a fool of. And then once they do it, it just magnifies itself and they start to lose control. You've got to somehow break that short circuit. God, this is a soap opera magnified to the umph degree. This is a real, this is real, this is happening. These are the fears, the anxieties, the loves, the, the, the joys, the, the ups, the downs. And when you know what I know of what's going on behind the scenes, it's far, far more interesting than a soap opera. Out there, in space, and in here, those, those two fields still have a tremendous future. Out there, and in here. Yes, well, that concludes this portion of our treatment. Right on, Doc. Another successful diagnosis. As some athletes' dependence on alcohol and drugs becomes more public, it's obvious that the role of the sports psychologist is becoming increasingly important. Now also, with women's sports growing in prominence around the country, there will be a growing need for more women in the field. Now one person whose job is to be a shrink for 25 patients in the dugout is a big league manager. Oakland Athletics manager Tony LaRusso doesn't have a degree in psychology, but he does have one in law. And frequently it seems that the law in the American League West is that the A's will finish first. Tony's here to tell us why anyone in his right mind would want to manage. Let's welcome Tony LaRusso. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for being with us. You know, you want to get to the ballpark, but let's see, let's talk about you. You were in the minor leagues about 16 years. Uh, you, you go to college, and after 16 years, you get a law degree from Florida State University. How, when you look back, how do you use that law, law degree and, and all the education as a big league manager? Well, I, I think uh, I'm careful to point out that that's not the only way that you can prepare to be a big league manager. But for me, I think there is a preparation prior to each and every game, each and every series, and the law teaches you the value of preparation. You can go in with the best case, but if the other guy beats you in the, uh, in the library and has more facts and more things put together, you lose a case. Also, the attention to detail. And as you know, baseball is, you know, it's an it's a inch here, a foot there. And sometimes the, the little piece of information that you have maybe sets up your player in a better position against the opponent. So I think preparation I learned in law school. All right, and the likelihood of being sued in the dugout is probably pretty minimal, too, as well. <laughs> Let's get some of the questions from the students. Who's got the first one? Hi, I'm Patrick from Centerville. 
Um, for guys playing baseball in college, how hard is it for them to keep up with their studies and to play? I think a lot depends on the school that you go to. Uh, you know, I really admire some of the uh, college coaches who emphasize education. They, they require the attendance in class. They have tutors to help guys. And then some of the people, hey, uh, what we do on the field is more important. So I think it really depends on the school. I, I really think that you have to put the education first. You'll always have time to play baseball. And we've got another one over here. I'm Emily Wu from McLean High School. Do you think that our society puts too much emphasis on the field of sports rather than education? That's a great question. Uh, I think it depends. I think there's a proper place. I think education is definitely number one. It's what most people, everybody needs. I think sports, it's a great uh, entertainment, but also, you know, if you, if you handle sports properly, you know, it's a great way of life. I mean, it reflects what life is all about, and it's competition, and it's us against you, and may the best man win, or woman. One more question quickly before the manager gets out of here, okay? Right here. Um, I'm Nadine Pryk from McLean High School, and I was wondering, what's it like managing a baseball team off the field? Is it like managing a big company? Uh, no, because we're a lot smaller. You know, you just talk about 25 players that were part of a big organization. I think the big thing I, I find all the time is you, you want to relate to the guys as people. And uh, sometimes you see them as, as stars and on the, on, the, uh, on the stage, on the playing field. But we relate as people. We try to build a family atmosphere with our team. And I, that's not quite the same as you can do in a large company. So it's really a, a group of guys trying to come together for six months and, and win a lot of games. With the ball game tonight, Tony's taking out a lot of valuable time. And we thank you very much for joining right. us, too, Tony. Baseball's Enjoy, right. best manager right. since 1988. Thanks for being with us. Now, when Tony goes to the bullpen in the late innings, he calls on his stopper. Dennis Eckersley. The Eck is his closer. Every team has one, at least every good team has one. And we've got one of our own coming up next. As we saw earlier, he's a real fanatic. So stay with us. Since I was about six, I dreamed of being a ball player. But by the same token, I knew that I wanted to go to college and get an education. Uh, it's just one of those dreams that, you know, I was fortunate enough to be blessed with the ability that happened. Uh, I'd probably be a PE teacher coaching and, and being involved in athletics, but no matter what your dream is, dreams don't always come true. You have to have something to fall back on, uh, and whatever that is, you have to do that as best you can, be it a school teacher, or a janitor, uh, anything. You know, whatever it is that you decide to do after you get out of school, have fun and do it the best you can. It's not as hard as people think. Have fun, do your work, enjoy every, enjoy every minute of school that you can because you have to work the rest of your life. And, and things become much more serious after that. So enjoy it. Now I think that you know teachers are underpaid. You know certainly are a lot more careers where where people have more of an impact on people than we do. We're essentially entertainers, and uh, but the media and the uh, the print uh, blow us up out of proportion. We're just normal guys who have the same problems and same needs as everyone else does, but. Everything's magnified a little bit. Trying not to get caught up in all the hoopla of what it's like to be a professional athlete because it's such a short time in your life, the majority of your life, you're going to be whoever, doing whatever, and you're not going to be a ball player. So I think if you get too caught up in it, you're fooling yourself. When our next guest gets injured, the team is more likely to send for a vet than a doctor. It weighs over 300 pounds and hails from the Galapagos Islands. Who is it? What is it is more like it? It's not a chicken, definitely not a moose, so what could it be? He's the Philly fanatic, and although he might come from the Galapagos Islands, he makes his home in Philadelphia's Veterans Stadium. Since 1978, the fanatic has made over a thousand home games, missing only four, and that's a stat no other Philly can match. Created by the minds that made the Muppets, the vet is his stage, and in it, he's Philly's 10th man and secret weapon. Outside of the costume, it's Dave Raymond, a.k.a. the Philly Fanatic. I got to ask you a question now. Was this a long-term dream of you as a college grad and you wanted to be a mascot? No, I, I immediately trashed my degree when someone <laughs> gave me something that I could do that I'd been doing normally, and that is be an idiot and pay me for it. So <laughs> I was very lucky to fall into that. Well, I'm sure Jim and I have some great stupid questions to ask you, but let's get some more interesting <laughs> ones from the audience here first. Susie. Um, hi, my name is Susie Lee, and I'm from McLean High School. I was wondering, do you... Do you regret any career choices that you have made so far? And if so, what are they? <laughs> well, it's all been by accident, Susie. So I, I've, I've, 
it's like being at the right place at the right time. You hear that though, everywhere you go. Usually the best jobs are, are that way. Um, I was just lucky to, to be graduating from college when I was. Uh, and of course, as I said, I trashed my degree. Um, I was a stock boy for the Phillies making money to go to school. And they came up with the idea of having a mascot. And of course, they went to the first person that they could ask that couldn't say no, because I was the low man in the totem pole. So I kind of got the job by default. And I've been a professional idiot ever since. So <laughs> we're going to keep right on going with it. All right, next question. Hi, I'm Dan Mallon from Gonzaga High School. I was wondering, what does your job include other than dancing and cheerleading for the Phillies? Well, there's a lot of stuff that I prepare for uh, on the offseason. I have to stay in shape. It's very hot. Uh, I have some of the same problems as an athlete does in that as I get into my 30s, and we won't mention how far that's been, um, I start to get old. And uh, I have to be careful about how I keep myself in shape. And I'm doing a lot of um, outside appearances. I do a lot of minor league baseball. But some of the most fun things I get to do are I visit hospitals and homes for the mentally retarded and the elderly. And those are the most rewarding because you can walk in and immediately have some fun with some people that generally don't seem to get the opportunity to have as much fun as we do. So <laughs> it's, it's exciting to do that. Very quickly, a third question. Uh, hi, my name is Lucas Wall, and I go to Centerville High School. Uh, I wanted to ask you if um, you ever had any acting experience, and if someone wants to become a mascot, do you recommend it? <laughs> Absolutely recommend it if you can get, if you can be lucky. I guess you have to be lucky. Um, didn't plan for it, have no acting experience. I was, uh, obviously, I must have been wearing a lampshade on a head at a few parties, and somebody thought I'd be good at this. All right, Dave, thank you very much. And don't be surprised now if Ron Shapiro, the agent, signs you up and has you modeling underwear like the big fellow over <laughs> don't here. Don't be so lucky. All right. <laughs> Well, that's about it, uh, Jimmy. Well, it certainly is. Well, the hour certainly has gone by quickly, and uh, about as fast as your professional career. I'm Ooh, sorry, I low blow, low blow. Two-week basketball. It's been a basketball. pleasure, and we hope your response is still positive to the question. So, you want to be in baseball? We want to thank all our guests, Donna Quante, uh, Ron Shapiro, Tony La Russa, and Dave Raymond, along with the professionals we interviewed on location. Now, we also want to thank our wonderful aud audience. Of course, they were bright. They were enthusiastic, right? And, uh, <laughs> and let's give yourselves a hand. hand. Yeah. All right. And for all of us, we'll see you at the ballpark. Stay tuned for information about how you can express your views about So You Want to Be in Baseball, coming up immediately following the show. Then WETA's triple header Big League Evening comes to an end with a profile of the life and career of pitching legend Nolan Ryan. Feel the heat coming up at 10 on WETA. So You Want to Be in Baseball was a special co-production between WETA and The Learning Channel, and we would like your comments about this program. Call our viewer response line 703-998-8889 and leave a message with your thoughts about this program and any ideas you may have for programming of a similar nature. Once again, call our viewer response line at 703-998-8889 with your feelings about So You Want to Be in Baseball. Your comments will help direct the course of future programming produced and broadcast by WETA. That number again is 703 998 